Dig out your caftan, daisy chains and love beads. We're taking a trip through the aromatic mists of time back to the psychedelic 60s, when love and Rizzlers were all you needed. Turn on with Joni Mitchell. In the height of the summer of love, I was singled out as kind of queen of the hippies. Tune in with the doors. Take this and high and take that and smoke this and drink this. And drop out with Easy Rider Dennis Hopper. It was a big party. A lot of drugs. A lot of free drugs. It was a wonderful time. Take the hippie trail from San Francisco to Kathmandu, pulling in for some free love en route. All I can remember is giving my socks to a young woman in the hope of getting a shag out of it. She, she made off with my socks. And buy yourself some hip threads on the streets of swinging London. The shops were a party, and Carnaby Street was an eternal party. So was the King's Road. Before blowing your mind at the hippie festival. Wet, muddy, chaotic, bad sound, Woodstock. When I was in England in 67, wow. Turn off your mind, relax and float downstream to a time when hippies ruled the world. Turn on, tune in, and drop turn on, out. Tune in, we're drop turned out. on, and we're tuned in, and we're very dropped out. The flower children first sprouted in San Francisco in the mid-1960s. They were the first generation to reject everything their parents stood for. They refused to go to war, they refused to work nine to five, and they refused to cut their hair. They wanted free love, not marriage, and enjoyed a diet of mind-expanding drugs rather than the suburban Sunday lunch. People in this community are not greedy for money. They are seekers. They are seekers of a more meaningful human experience. The year for hippies was 1967. The summer of love and the hippies of San Francisco predated Alan Titchmarsh by 30 odd years as they made over Golden Gate Park, transforming public spaces into a pleasure garden and holding love-ins to celebrate the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Something was happening in California. Nobody knew what. Uh, so we went there to try and find out. It was a group of of smiling kids. They were gentle, there were no hard drugs, uh, there was no violence. I was enchanted by them. That was the flower power and flower generation. And the people in San Francisco were rather grateful that all these kids, instead of causing trouble, were trying to spread love and flowers. The love is exactly what it means, what it says, is that people come here to love one another. You just wanted to lie around and talk and make love and smoke a bit of pot and uh, chill out. The thing that's happening is people are just getting together to have a good time. Such a strange vibration. There were like uh, probably about 30,000 people in Golden Gate Park and there were uh, about 25 guys parachuted out of airplanes throwing LSD you know, and had thousands and thousands of tabs of LSD. And there were people like, you know, having sex uh, out in the open and uh, it was amazing. And they would pop out of the bushes with a flute and a cape and, and give you a piece of paper and on it would, would tell you of the events that were coming up. Uh, uh, where you could crash, uh, where the food was. Everything was uh, pretty much free at that time. For me, I've always thought that the time to have been young would have been you know, hanging around in San Francisco in 1967. It still does look to me like everything that rock culture and pop culture and youth culture should be about is enshrined in that kind of golden high summer, really. I got engaged in San Francisco, we had a very romantic evening in San Francisco, but at no time did I feel the need to put a daisy or indeed a marigold or any type of flower in my hair.
The hippies were about sex and drugs and most of all rock and roll. Music carried the hippie creed of freedom, peace and self-expression. And the high priestess of getting high and saving the world was Joni Mitchell. Woke up, it was a Chelsea morning and the first thing that I heard was a song outside my window. The traffic wrote the words. At the time that I would sit down to write, I would probably begin from a position that, that words were mighty, and if you could find the right combination, that you could affect change. Won't you stay? We'll put on the day, and we'll wear it till the night comes. Woke up. It was obvious that there was a songwriter here of, of, of tremendous stature, of great depth of uh, great profundity. There was a startling talent there. The red, green and gold to welcome you Crimson crystal beads to beckon The poets went to be songwriters and that became a medium that they used and it was a much, much more powerful medium than just writing some poetry. Now the curtain opens on a portrait of today the streets are paved with passers-by. The, the human species is uh, in trouble, you know, so everybody has to do their little part. Woke up, it was a Chelsea morning, and the first thing that I knew, there was milk and toast and honey, and a bowl of oranges too. And she really was this kind of golden-haired angel of, of peace and love and we are stardust, we are golden, we're getting back to the garden. Sing it with me now. We are stardust, billion year old carbon, we are golden. She pinned in those couple of sentences the very essence of why it is that we're all here, where we all really came from. Mainly because of that section that, that, you know, we are stardust, we are golden. You know, it's like a mantra or something. It's like a prayer to our highest tendencies, you know, to overcome our humanness. I admit Joni Mitchell in 1967. There was a beautiful blonde sitting in the corner with what looked like to be a large Bible on her knee, which was intriguing enough, apart from the fact that she was uh, very beautiful. And so I went over and introduced myself, uh, went back with Joni to her hotel. She played me probably 20 of the most beautiful songs I'd ever heard in my life. I couldn't believe that anybody was writing with such beautiful sense of the fragility of the human soul. And I was in love from that moment. When I came to live back in, you know, for the first time in America, I went to stay at Crosby's, and uh, Joni and I hooked up at a party at David's place, and I went back to her house and didn't leave for a couple of years. I suppose her most famous song is Big Yellow Taxi. They paved paradise, put up a parking lot. With a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hot spot. Don't it always seem to go? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. They paved paradise, put up a parking lot. Now they took all the trees, put them in a tree museum. Charged all the people a dollar and a half just to see them. I said, don't it always seem to go? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. I'd gone to the Hawaiian Islands for the first time, arrived in the middle of the night. I went to the hotel, it was uh, in Oahu, it was a skyscraper, woke up in the morning, threw back the curtains, and in the distance were green, green mountains and white flying birds. And I looked down, and as far as the eye could see was a parking lot. Don't it always seem to go? You don't know what you've got till it's gone.
and the concept is, you know, which will win, you know, nature or, or the concrete jungle. Are we going to pave everything over, you know, are we going to leave parks, you know, um, or are we going to fall one way or another and will then the jungle take it all back? Big Yellow Taxi did manage to turn a couple of parking lots in America back into parks. And I know wherever a tree was being cut down, someone trotted it out. I, I suppose it did a little bit of good. Put up a parking lot. <laughs> The flower children didn't just reject the entire moral and political philosophy of the older generation. They also rejected their boring threads, man. The cats and the chicks favoured riotous colours and flowing fabrics from groovy boutiques that were more like nightclubs. What did you do there? The shops were a party, and Carnaby Street was an eternal party. So was the King's Road. I do remember Bieber, bus stop. Fantastically exciting shops. I remember Granny Takes a Trip. I used to love Granny Takes a Trip. These old, old but gorgeous clothes inside and a real sort of everything was hanging and touching. And to go in there was a real experience, extremely exciting. And you really felt you were part of, part of the scene. They all come out to groove about Boas and then a lot of hats big brimmed hats with flowers on the hats. A lot of, it was fabulous clothes. We'd taken off the bra, so the next thing is to wear things that make unharnessed tits look good. So there were unstructured clothes, no shoulder pads, no belts. I mean, they, they floated and flowed over our bodies was the idea. Girls in Laura Ashley frocks. Or chicks, sorry, chicks in Laura Ashley frocks. It's all too beautiful. Clothes and fashion were a way to express yourself. I mean, you could signal from 500 yards, I am not a chartered accountant. I was not a convincing hippie, you know what I mean? I, I bought all the gear. I, I bought uh, a ludicrously overpriced caftan, which is made out of a bedspread, I thought. Um, and uh, huge trousers, flared trousers, and, we, and I just, I've never had, the, I've, you know, I've always been a little fat bloke, and, and so I looked ludicrous, and I knew I looked ludicrous, but I felt obliged once a week to take to the streets in this outfit. Those awful Afghan coats, and they smelt so ghastly, but people wore them, they really did. Oh, I had an Afghan coat, obviously. God, they smelt. Oh. How on earth anybody who was wearing an Afghan coat ever managed to attract anybody? If you were going out with a guy who wore one of those coats, it was sort of over in a day. Finished. Couldn't be doing with that. <laughs> The place to show off your kaftan and afghan, if you could see them of course, was one of London's trendy new nightclubs, where freaks freaked out to the crazy sounds and the happening new light shows. Welcome to the Underground Freak Out, or UFO Club. UFO and the roundhouse and these places where you just heavy with the fog of marijuana and cosmic rock music at very loud volumes, in which people were basically like staying up all night, plotting revolution and having loads of sex. I'll be with you when it was really something new. You'd never really experienced it before. It was a London-wide phenomenon. It was the focus for that scene. I went to UFO fairly regularly because I, I liked the music. You know, you'd get old people in there like Yoko Ono would be 
doing things in a bag with a man. Or, you know, the Beatles were there, the Who were there, a dance group called the Exploding Galaxy who might appear in the nude or might be doing something else. Nude people running round in the audience. You know, to the girls stripping off and the body painting and the Pink Floyd and the weird noises and the feedback and the smoke and the lights. You got these incredible shadows cast, which was very dramatic. So we thought, oh, this is good. And so as you move the light from there to there, obviously the, ju the, the shadows would jump, you know, the opposite way. That was sort of, oh wow, man, you know, far out. And then if you put on top of that the old blippy, the old blippy sort of blip, blip, blip oil things, you had a light show, a mind-expanding light show. All this quick sort of and still and frozen moments that you would do under light. One was doing that all the time within the music, within the fashion, within the dancing. That was, that was what it was sort of all about. So it was a very, very intense atmosphere. Most people stoned and quite a lot of them on acid. I, I did take acid before I went. The only time in my life I ever voluntarily took it, and it was really nice. I mean, I always say to people, again, rather flippantly, it was like going to Stratford-on-Avon, but like going to Stratford-on-Avon, once you've done it, you don't feel the need to do it again. A regular at the UFO, a wild musician with the deceptively mundane name of Arthur Brown. His act was called, for reasons that at this point should be obvious, the crazy world of Arthur Brown, and he ignited the charts with his number one hit, Fire. Yes, it's number one, it's Top of the Pops! Watching Top of the Pops with my mum and my brothers, and suddenly there's this, this, this voice going, I am the god of hell, fire! I was like, what the hell is that? I am the god of hell, fire! And I bring you... used to come on with this huge flaming head and everything was on fire. You know, the Blue Pit used to make those advent things with the four candles at the side, didn't they? Every year, and every year they'd warn you that it wasn't to muck about with, and clearly Arthur Brown hadn't heeded Leslie Judd's advice, because he was wearing it on his head. Well, the crown uh, went through very many stages. Eventually we hit on the idea of putting a, a pie dish and filling it full of petrol with a strap around my head and one screw through the pie dish. Of course, the heat used to travel down the screw onto my skull. So after a while of explosions and, you know, petrol falling all over and setting both myself and stages and clubs alight, um, sometimes, of course, the petrol would fall off and, and so my face might get slightly burnt and sometimes the clothes would catch on fire. I went to the dressing room and they're throwing, you know, jugs of water over his head because his hair is actually on fire and you know that you know this this ain't been some put on you know i mean he's actually just thought this thing up with no concern to to life and limb or or haircut and i do have a bird which is a cockatiel that will if you walk in the door will pronounce i'm the bird of hellfire He's hot, he's sexy, he's dead. It's Jim Morrison. While they were throwing a dampened tea towel over Arthur Brown, the LA rock scene was getting steamed up over the doors. Psychedelic minstrels, led by self-proclaimed poet, singer, and leading light of the rock roll family, Jim Morrison. I think the doors and, and Morrison were all about freedom. Breaking on through to the other side. Opening the doors of perception. William Blake says if the doors of perception were cleansed, man would see things as they are. Infinite. That's where it comes from. Well, playing live with the doors became a uh, 
some people have said, sort of a mystical experience uh, in that what you do ideally as a musician is you give yourself up to the music. There's a moment in time and you enter that moment in time and just rock it out and just balls to the wall barrel through the music. The Indian shaman came and joined us on stage and we danced wildly, you know. It was a, it was a Dionysian revelry, you know, it was a Greek revelry. Jim was dead good looking and let's be honest, they were from LA and that's half the show. They were as much showbiz as any other band. Uh, in a lot of ways, the most overrated band of all time. Jim Morrison was the definitive rock star. Gorgeous, untamed, faintly ridiculous, and with a penchant for leather kecks which he couldn't keep his todger in. It ended up with him getting arrested on stage for indecent exposure. When we heard that uh, the Doors and the Jefferson Airplane were coming to the Roundhouse, I mean, a big buzz all over town. Raymond Daniel Lanzari, occupation, musician, organist. Uh, Jim, occupation. Um. What an incredible concert that was. Psychedelic West Coast comes to psychedelic hippie London. Jim Morrison, he came on stage and it was electric. The place sort of shimmered and moved and your eyes just went to him and then didn't leave him. Uh, he was extraordinarily sexy, extraordinarily good looking, incredibly charismatic. There was Jim with the TV cameras on him. Those great big boxy TV cameras were hysterical. Morrison goes out into the audience and he starts, he starts moving around and he's holding the microphone and trying to get people to talk and to sing and to scream. And meanwhile, Robbie and I are just playing our solos. You know, we're doing what we got to do. What would a bass player would play? He's playing that with his left hand. He's playing all these Bach-esque curly cues with his right hand. And maybe it was agile. No, maybe it was a bit galling that then Morrison just tosses his ringlets and gets the old fella out from time to time and he's the lizard king and he's like, but I'm doing all the bloody work. Light My Fire became the number one song in America and it was the summer of love. It was absolutely amazing. Just a very powerful idea. Come on baby, light my fire. We can go higher. And classic Morrison and our love becomes a funeral pyre. It, no time to wallow in the mire? That's a lyric. <laughs> they've done fire, they've done higher. What have we got less? And it's just very Jim to say, wallow in the mire. It, it's such an obviously forced rhyme. His album, American Poet, the title's only half true. He was American. The doors weren't on the bill at Woodstock, but pretty much everyone else was. Wet, muddy, chaotic, thrilling, friendly, a lot of drugs, a lot of marijuana, bad sound, Woodstock. If you were a hippie, you had to be at Woodstock, America's biggest free festival of the 60s. A farmer called Max Yazga showed a generosity of spirit unusual to his profession and said, get on my land, to a lucky half a million who reveled in three days of peace, love, mud, dope and music from a host of big names. John Baez, Cock, Country Joe, Crosby, Stills, Nash, 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 Richie, Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix, Santana, John Sebastian, John Sly, and, and the Mary Stone, Stone, The Who. When we first heard what someone was trying to do, we were a little incredulous. Nothing like that had ever happened on that kind of scale before. There were all these people that were kind of like hippies in their community. And they were known as the weird kid on the block. But suddenly, there were 500,000 weird kids all on the same block. And they thought, we are not alone. Woodstock provided that kind of an atmosphere of kids gathering together, 
and realizing that right then and there that they'd arrived. Now come on, generals, let's move fast. Your big chance is here at last. Now you can go out and get those reds, because the only good commie is one that's dead. And you know that peace can only be one when you're going on the kingdom come sing it. It's really amazing, man. It looks like some kind of uh, biblical, epical, unbelievable scene. This thing was too big. <laughs> it was too big for the world. What you might call a hippie ethic is one of love, one of peace, one of sharing. If you had food and somebody didn't, you shared. This happened a lot at Woodstock. If you got food, feed other people. Bugsy to the pink and white tent. Keep feeding each other. And if you're too tired to chew, pass it on. Uh, my great moment of uh, being the voice of Woodstock was when I got to stand up there and say, Good morning. What we have in mind is breakfast in bed for 400,000. Now, it's not going to be steak and eggs or anything. But it's going to be good food and we're going to get it to you. Which is when we introduced hippies to granola and started carrying it around to hippies in sleeping bags who looked at it, you know, and said, what's that, gravel? <laughs> but they tried it and they liked it. We're all feeding each other. We must be in heaven, man. I suppose that the festival was the nearest kind of working embodiment of the hippie dream. And we were living the dream in Blighty too. Hippies flocked to freak out in our green and pleasant land. And it was like kind of going on this great big camping holiday for three or four days in the country and a lot of your best pals went too. I love people who smoke the joint before they put the tent up. You know, and they're looking at it three days later. <laughs> it's, oh, that wasn't a good idea, was it? It's turned into, they've got the guy ropes on the inside, and it's, it's like a Rubik's Cube. And then the first festival I went to it was muddy, I had suede boots on, so I paid four hippies to carry me to the tent. And carry me they did, but being hippies, one of them just about, just about, his strength went out just at the end, so he didn't get paid, because he... I got nudged a little bit of splash on the mud on the boot. I like the part where the girls took off their clothes and ran around. Though. That was kind of cool to me. I mean, I went one year, people were carrying a coffin about, the women pretending to give birth in a field. There were these people with cone-head people made up like that. There was one pop bloke, one like start bollock naked, climbing a tree, and it was painted blue. And then I walked around the corner, and there's a red one. And I always say that the trick with festival toilets is to treat them like rock climbing. The trick is not to look down. Don't ever look down. And, and in, in, in and out. God knows how people do drugs at festivals, because you certainly don't want to hang around in those toilets. I actually saw someone go in there with a book once, and I thought this must be his first festival. <laughs> Sexual act between two consenting adults should be legal, and that people should be uninhibited in their sexual expression. I think about you, Dave. You would sleep with a lot of people because sex was something that you shared, love was something that you shared. Hippies decided free love with whoever, whenever, was where it was at. The natural extension of that would be that everybody made love to everybody else. A great collective expression of libido that would be uh, the great group group. All I can remember is giving my socks to a young woman in the hope of getting a shag out of it, and she, she made off with my socks. So if you had a party without couples only, you'd have all these single men showing up and freaking all the women out. As we sort of wriggled around on the floor, men kept arriving and taking off their clothes and lying down on the floor with us, and no women. And I was thinking, this is not the idea. 
I seem to have bits of men all over me. I mean, they're so... And I, I just thought, uh-oh, out of here. Like all good ideas. And so I just hopped up and put my clothes on and off. Free love is, is a bizarre concept. Love is far too pleasurable to be free. It should be really seriously expensive, and in my experience it has been. So happy together. There is no such thing as free love. That's ridiculous. You know, people cannot learn that quickly, non-possessiveness. Mostly it was just kids in a candy store, you know what I mean? It was just tactile self-indulgence, a lot of it. There's no question that Joni's right, it was self-indulgent, but God, help us all. <laughs> How wonderful. And if the rides were easy, Dennis Hopper should know. Easy Rider, the hippie dream writ large on celluloid. Starring Peter Fonda, directed by and starring Dennis Hopper. A road movie that tells the story of two men who, years before Norman Tebbit, got on their bikes and went off to look for America, but they couldn't find it anywhere. It was just about going across the United States and finding yourself in them big choppers, you know what I'm saying? Those big choppers back in the day, that was some good shit. Nobody had ever recorded anything about the hippie movement or about what was going on in America at that time. We were basically doing pillow talk with Doris Day and Rock Hudson and, uh, and uh, feel-good movies for a very conservative, uptight society. And we'd already gone through the 60s, the summer of love and all that had already happened, and no movies had been made about this at all. Previous to that, the hippies were the bad guys. In this film, the hippies were the heroes. I thought of it as a sort of mother goose uh, tale about what was going on by two outlaws, two uh, renegades who were going to uh, be like almost cowboys sitting around campfires. <laughs> well, that's, that's got a real nice uh, taste to it. The, the turn on sequence, the uh, getting Jack high. How's your joint, George? I believe it went out. I got, I got to talking so much, I clean forgot about... Uh... They smoked 72 spliffs for real in that scene and shot it over a whole night and they were all whacked. I mean, it was all, everyone was whacked out on everything that there was in the film, you know. I think this is a crackpot idea. That's what I think. Smoking is a little weird acting, you know. It can be at times. Uh, it was a good night that night. <laughs> My favourite scene in that is the, you know, when he goes, you got a helmet? He goes, yeah, I got myself a real nice helmet. <laughs> I got a beauty. And then it cuts to a shot of him in his gold American football helmet, which is way too small for him now, so it rides up right on the top of his head, sitting on the back of the bike with that big Jack Nicholson grin. If you wanna be a bird. Fantastic. I was really impressed by that. The strangest and most memorable scene from the film is the acid trip in the graveyard. At the graveyard scene and the acid, that's very strange. Very odd. It's unnerving, actually. Unnervingly odd. What's that? We, we knew we were going to take a psychedelic trip. I don't think any of us really, you know, acted in any kind of city heavy acid way I think it was more of our placement and our dialogue and that type of thing I think really what made it look like an acid trip was the edit it's an incredible moment when we take the LSD past the LSD it goes up the side of this crypt it was an overcast day and there was no sun and as it goes up the side of the crypt suddenly you see this great wave of the sun. With Dennis, it was like you were the kite he was flying. I know you, I know you, I know you. Everything was free and loose and crazy and everything that came to his mind we did and we did as well as we could. Yeah, I know you guys, I know you John. You can tell they're all off the faces and it's a bit you feel like you're intrusi intruding on something you shouldn't be, really. You, I know you. Oh, wow. I don't even know if 
I like you. <laughs> that was shot with Peter, the two girls, myself, one cameraman, one sound man, and everybody else had walked because I got in a fight with everybody the night before and uh, fired them all. They all left, actually. They didn't fire, they left. <laughs> so, and I just told the others that they left, I killed them. That's all. You know, be okay. Yeah. So they stayed. It showed a temperature of a time. Uh, I think if historians want to go back and look at the 60s, they have to, will have to consider Easy Rider as a source material of some sort of, in some way, uh, for the music, if nothing else, and uh, hopefully for other things besides that. But that's what I think of as a time capsule. I think it's precious. I think it's, you know, a historic, small masterpiece. I think it's a way of knowing about an era that uh, will never come again and was um, splendid, full of love. In graveyards, crash pads, festivals, hippies turn to psychedelic drugs such as LSD. One pill makes you larger and one pill makes you small And the ones that mother gives you don't do anything at all Go ask Alice Here it is folks, that terrible drug LSD Chasing rabbits And you know you're going to fall Tell them all who come Smoking caterpillar I'm not quite sure how it works, but it seems to refract the light in various ways, so that um, it's, if you're looking at a tree, it starts to strobe in front of you, and the tree starts to actually move and walk towards you and grab you and pick you up and take you away. I started shooting my hand out and seeing sparks and energy coming out of my hand, and, and uh, uh, the visuals of the cars going the opposite way. I, I don't know uh, that we received enlightenment as much as all of a sudden you realize that everything is not what it appears. And that was a pretty good revelation, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just surrounded by every place I look, I see sun. There two guys sitting on a fence, and they said, Oh, um, excuse me, mate. Um, help us out here, would you? Um, what color is that field over there? Because he says it's yellow, and I say it's green. And I looked at it, and as far as I could see, it was blue, you know. The universe was going. Paisley, man. Ooh, babe, we're gonna, it's like LSD. I mean, when, when, you know, you're in the throes of acid, there's oneness and God and life and light, but there's also death. Let me take you down. Acid was first regarded as a wonder drug, a ticket to new realms of consciousness. But hippies soon realized that the price of that ticket could be higher than they thought. But as, as uh, the police chief, uh, Cahill, said to me... And now we've had experience where people who have taken LSD have gone in through plate glass windows. We have people who are inside with LSD coming out through plate glass windows. And so I don't know what direction these people are moving in. When they're on a bad trip they would decide they could fly and go out of a 30-story window. People took LSD as a sort of a challenge. I don't know that anybody really took it for fun. It wasn't really a recreational drug. It was too dangerous for that. It was touted in the 60s, LSD, as the answer. And some people completely thought it was going to be the answer and, and it was going to cause a revolution in the head, literally a revolution in pe inside people's consciousness. So it was a kind of really central drug to the hippies. One has to presume that a great deal of what was written through the 60s and 70s was written under the influence of it. I mean it must be the LSD experience was essential to opening my doors of perception. I am the person I am today because of ingesting that hallucinogenic substance. Marijuana, cocaine, uh, LSD, uh, these things can certainly, in the beginning, open up like doors of perception. 
but they can quickly close them down too. You know I smoked a lot of grass. Oh Lord, I popped a lot of pills. And there was the small matter of the law. The old Bill were no respecter of the stashes of the rich and famous. But I've never touched nothing. You've got Paul McCartney up there in his like, completely remote farm up in Scotland with a few seeds. Yeah, well, we got a load of seeds, you know, kind of in the post, uh, and we didn't know what they were, you know, we kind of planted them all, and five of them came up like, five of them came up illegal, you know. It's a sort of Jack and the Beanstalk fairy tale vibe to it. All those busts of high profile rock stars, whether they just had. Uh, stuff for their own consumption or whether they were growing it as Paul McCartney was. It was a way of trying to stop everybody else doing it. But it was a losing battle from the beginning. When people like uh, Jagger and McCartney and that, and all of them were getting busted, every group that left England and went through, you know, customs control, they, they were on the lookout. I remember Chris had an indigestion pill and we all laughed as they carted it off, analysed it, and brought it back. And you know, I think it was a Rennie or something, you know. <laughs> ...about expanding your mind and growing your own. And so Kathmandu became a mecca for hippies in search of cut-priced dope, fashionable flowing robes, acid-drenched sunsets, and a quick wash and brush up with Eastern mysticism. As usual, the Beatles were pioneers, taking the long and winding road to the ashrams of India. Remember, these are the four most famous men in the world, uh, arguably the four most culturally powerful men in the world. Once they've overturned the world's musical tastes, I think they feel they've got to press on and overturn the world's philosophy as well, or at least overturn their own. And it's an implicit rejection of conventional religion and, and conventional uh, social structures. Lennon was the, one of the first Beatles to take acid and uh, opened the Tibetan Book of the Dead, read out the various instructions and then played them back to himself when he was on acid and came up with Tomorrow Never Knows and turn off your mind, relax and float down the street. were always craving was simplicity. Now, the irony is, of course, that if you're dragging a lot of cows around in Kathmandu with the endless tinkle of those bloody bells, what you'd really like is a pizza hut, I guess. Older brothers of mates of mine would, would hitchhike east, you know, and that was the way everyone went for their big trips. Or else they'd all get into a bus um, and paint it with flowers and then kind of just drive off towards Turkey, basically. They sort of appeal to our sense of just putting, like a little snail, just putting all your house on your back and just going, you know? The idea of getting in a camper van or a similar vehicle, ex-ambulance, which is another popular one, ex-ice cream van, although they always take the chimes out. Hippies would go up a lot in my estimation if they took an ex-ice cream van, left the chimes in as they drove to Kathmandu, because that would bring a little bit of peace and happiness to the world as they drove to Kathmandu. You want to get outside the first world and outside our little uh, horrible white people paradigm that we've set up and sort of dig what it's like to not care and be part of something else, something other. I think that's why people do it. That's why I would do it. And of course the drugs. Okay.
A one, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> John Lennon took his experience with Eastern mysticism to heart and teamed up with Yoko to devote himself to ending the world's ills and promoting peace by staying in bed for a week in a Montreal hotel room surrounded by the world's press. They were giving peace a chance if making life a little difficult for the chambermaids. Things like John and Yoko's bedding were just wonderful events. They were all part of life's extremely crazy and rich pattern. I mean, being a hippie and being like that meant being constantly inventive and doing something new and John Lennon was the past master at this. John and Yoko had a good idea. They, that sort of branched off. They thought, now I'm fed up sitting cross-legged. Um, what can we do? Let's book into a hotel. Much better. Oh, let's, let's have a bed in or a piece up or something. Uh, so they, that was fine. They were in a lovely hotel. They had room service. They'd got it just right. People are still talking about it now, which means it, it worked. But not all hippie protests were so placid. We did things like write fuck on our foreheads so that we couldn't be photographed and wrap ourselves in flags and in various disrespectful ways and spend a lot of time demonstrating against the war in Vietnam and fighting the police. And that gave rise to practically everything because once they found uh, the mechanism for opposition and once they found the style then it ignited lots of other things. People began to think in terms of freedom to be whatever it was they were, whether that was gay or Buddhist or stoned. And first up against the wall was David Frost. Twenty hippies under the guidance of guest Jerry Rubin infiltrated the audience of the Frost program and wreaked havoc on live television, armed with flowers, joints and water pistols. Jerry, you asked if you could be joined up here by two of your colleagues. Would you just like so to introduce them for us? Because this whole thing is not me as an individual. We're involved in a massive revolution of young people. They were activist hippies. I mean, they didn't sit around smoking dope and believing that kind of smoking dope and peace and love and playing music was a way to change the world. They thought you had to take direct action. Well, they've got to admit that they're living on a dying planet and they are messing each other up. I remember that gesture was going on a great deal. It won't save our civilization, it might save our planet, it might save our species. And that's what we're concerned with, that's all. The signal was supposed to be when, uh, when Reuben lit a joint and handed it to Frost. It's an experience, try it, it's an experience. No, I, I, this is, huh? No, thank you. It's nervous. <laughs> they invaded the David Frost show. They were all in the audience and they clambered up onto the stage and started shouting and swearing screaming and effectively brought the show to a standstill. Stuart Dickey's a go! Look at that! It's Felix Dennis, who now owns Maxim, right? Shooting him with a, a water pistol and all kinds of good fun going on. The DDT content inside you is toxic. Mick Farron, although quite a kind of practical jokerish guy. He was rep he was representative of that new hippie movement that was much more politicised and angry, that was saying, you know, let's have a bona fide revolution. Not just a revolution in our heads where we stop going to work and we smoke dope, but a revolution where we smash the system. <laughs> There's no big kind of revolutionary protest. It was just, let's have some fun on a Saturday. It was all television. And I think if anybody understood that, it should have been David Frost, and probably did. It's big, so pathetic, and so oh, childish, right. and so pointless, <laughs> and we'll be right back. But as any school kid knows, summer doesn't last forever. The nights were drawing in, and violence, drug-related deaths, and rampant commercialism spelt the end of the hippie dream. I don't think anybody really dreamt that dream like that. People tried to live that way. But some of them were the most violent people I've ever met. And they were, if you didn't sign on for love and peace, they'd smash your face in. Can you understand that stupid, no fence, no fence? The hard.
hard drugs had arrived with, and the pushes had arrived. And these children were on hard drugs and therefore were, were not flower children anymore. The crowd called out for more. The movement that was put together during the 60s was actually very grand and world encompassing. I mean, it, we didn't think small. And that, I think, has got forgotten in time, just how big the vision was. The hippies actually did do a lot of things. They changed the generation's attitude to Vietnam. Even if it was only pushing flowers down the barrels of guns, that's a pretty extraordinary thing to do. They changed our generation's attitude to sex. They changed that generation's attitude to drugs. You know, hippies and, uh, are a kind of historical moment in time. In a way, their, their philosophies are actually still very much alive and still very important. It became a business and it became it became, uh, 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 it was a great place for criminals to suddenly make money and make profit selling drugs. The dream stopped and the reality started. It was a beautiful flower that bloomed purely kind of in the moonlight for a moment, really. I mean, the hippie thing may have a, a beginning time and an ending time, you know, but the true spirit of what was beautiful of it was very brief. We never stop doing it. Peace, love, and occasionally ice cream. Yum. That her face at first just goes sleep. Turn the